that are here. Adam Kravitz. I see Adam in the back. Adam. Uh, we've got Wanda Muzon. Wanda. Hi, Wanda. Uh, Michael Rittis. Paul Mocha is with us. I saw Herb Frank. Herb is sitting in the back. Uh, let's see. Stacy Kilroy. I don't know if she arrived yet. Or Saul Gross. But they are on their way and anticipated. Uh, Kirk Pascal. I see Kirk is there. That's great. And Jonathan Parker. Jonathan? Who, Jonathan, who happens to be a candidate on the ballot for the for the state house. Are there any other candidates? Anyone else whose name is on a ballot here in November? I would absolutely recognize you. Okay, so that's the group. Uh, thank you for coming out. If you're a member of Miami Beach United, we really appreciate it. If not, you got a little flyer. It says MiamiBeachUnited.org for a very uh, modest contribution. You can become a member and connected to our organization, and we would really, really appreciate it. Who is Miami Beach United? Miami Beach United fights to improve quality of life for residents by advocating with a unified message on key citywide issues. You won't hear us talk about things at the neighborhood level. You won't hear us talk about smaller issues. But when it's something big, then we get interested. And this is something big. Transportation and congestion is a critical issue in Miami Beach. Everyone knows that. And thankfully, our city commission has identified this issue and taken some action. So it's now it's an appropriate time to recognize we have some commissioners in the house. Commissioner Joy Malakoff, thank you for coming, Commissioner. I, Commissioner John Aleman is right there. Commissioner. I saw Commissioner Michael Rico. He is here. There is. Any other commissioners with us? Oh, yeah, the president, we know about that. Okay, thank you all for coming out. Um, so the, commit, the commission's really working it. They developed a master transportation plan. There are uh, plans and now things actually happening with the expansion of the trolleys, including uh, Mid Beach. There's some exciting work coming uh, in terms of intelligent transportation and parking system. So a lot of good activity. And now the city of Miami Beach is fast-tracking light rail. So specifically tonight, we're going to talk about the focus on the light rail project on Miami Beach. And you'll hear all about it, which starts at, at Fifth and Alton and makes sense around the beach. Now to really understand that though, you have to have a little context from the county. The county has a program called SMART, Strategic Miami Area Rapid Transit. That's SMART. Who would be against SMART, right? That's a good program. So they have that program in place. And the, the part of that program, that has six corridors, but the one that's really important to us is what's called the Beach Corridor. That starts at 41st and 2nd in Midtown, makes its way through Miami, and then it's going to come over the MacArthur Causeway towards 5th and Alton. So we really need to understand that project, and thankfully we are with the, the special guests that we have tonight. A couple things I want you to keep in mind. One is, this is a very significant deal. Transportation is a critical issue on the beach. You know, putting tracks down like this, I mean, this is important. And in fact, Miami Beach United, as we've put out our platform for the year, we've identified this as one of our top two priorities. And maybe at the end I'll tell you about the second, but that's really what we think it is about. The second thing I want to emphasize is this project has, is going through additional planning and design, so not all questions are ready to be answered. And you'll probably hear some people say, well, we're not sure about that. And that's fine. Now, sometimes that can be frustrating, but I would ask you not to take it as frustrating. Take it as an opportunity to give input. Take it as an opportunity to get your ideas on, on the table. And I think that's a really important uh, perspective. And finally, what we want you to do coming out of this is be engaged. That's especially important because at this point in time, there is no mechanism for voting on the beach. In other words, the commission can elect with four votes to go do this. So it's a good thing to, to get engaged. Here's how we're going to approach it. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to hear from the county, and we're going to hear the perspective on the beach corridor project. What's happening on the other side of the bay? And then we're very pleased to have a number of distinguished uh, folks from the city of Miami Beach and their consultants to describe the project. You'll get the facts. 
But then we'll hit some perspective. And I have a distinguished panel here on the left, and I will be introducing them to you. We're going to march up there. We're going to talk about it from about 7 to 7.30. 7.30, the talking heads will stop. And what we really want to do is hear from residents. What's on your mind? What are your questions? And we'll have both the, the city of Miami Beach. You'll have your panel. And we won't answer everything, but we'll do our very best that you walk out of with information and know where to take it from there. So just to get the, uh, the, the party going here, I am very honored to recognize and introduce our, 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 our featured guest here, Commissioner Francis Suarez. He has another commitment tonight, so he's been good enough to slide this in and take a little time with us, maybe about 10 minutes to talk to us. Let me just give you a little bit about his background. He is a commissioner in the city of Miami. He is the vice chair of the Metropolitan Planning Organization. The MPO does countywide planning. So this is someone that knows about it. He is an announced candidate for the city of Miami mayor position in that election in 2017. And on a personal note, I'm honored to share the stage with him again. He and I recently co-presented at a good government session for, with uh, Commissioner Katie Sorensen. So I want to thank uh, the commissioner very much, Commissioner Suarez. Let's make sure your mic is back. So, uh, first of all, thank you for that introduction and for sort of, sort of setting the stage on this discussion. Uh, I brought with me, and I will leave with you because I, I unfortunately have to make my comments and then I have to get going. This is the uh, MPO study of the Beach Corridor. So I wanted to leave this here with you all. It's obviously a public document, um, and it was produced uh, and, fi and finalized on June of 2015. So it has a tremendous amount of detail in terms of how the MPO views the linkage between uh, the city of Miami and Miami Beach and really the entire system because as Mark explained, um, we are a county of about 2.7 million residents, but we feel like we're 27 million residents. And the reason why is because we don't, we're not connected. We don't have a system of connectivity, of transit connectivity in Dade County. If you go to any major city in the world, they have some form of rapid or mass transit. And, and it's really affecting our quality of life. I mean, I drove over here, and I obviously today is somewhat anomalous because the president is in the city of Miami Beach. But I, I'm driving into the beach, obviously against traffic, and the traffic going out, I mean, it was just unbelievable. So uh, I, I joked when I arrived that to get to my next hearing, uh, my next appointment, I'm gonna have to take a helicopter. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that this congest congestion is real, and this congestion is only gonna get worse if we do nothing. That is a fact. I can tell you in the city of Miami, there is a, a part of this system that, as, as Mark described it, goes from downtown Miami, basically the 41st or the midtown in the city. And that is probably the densest corridor in the southern United States. And it's a corridor that if it's built out um, as of right, meaning no zoning variances, no increases in density, we don't do anything for a developer, but they build within the zoning envelope that they have left, we're talking about an additional thousands and thousands of units in that corridor. So for the city of Miami, having you know, rapid transit along that corridor is a tremendous priority. Uh, as Mark was saying, uh, the county, I think, this year started to finally really realize and get a grasp of this issue. And the, way, the reason I say that is because in February, as the vice chair and the highest ranking city official on the MPO, I presented a resolution that was unanimously adopted. By the way, it's a 23 member board. So it's very, very difficult to get consensus with that many members. You have all 13 county commissioners, and I wanna, I wanna recognize Valerie Trueva from my Xavier Suarez's office, who's back here. He's a member of the Policy Executive Committee, of which the mayor of Miami is a, a, a member, uh, Xavier Suarez is a member, uh, I think Bruno Marrero is a member, and uh, Mayor Levine is also a member. And so that's a standing committee of the MPO just on what some call Bay Link, Beach Corridor, whatever you want to call it. But we passed in February uh, making mass transit the highest priority for transit in Dade County. Why? Because you have a variety of agencies, state, federal, local, 
that continue to build more and more roads and highways and spend hundreds of millions of dollars doing that. Um, and the, the, the reality is that we have to speak coherently with a voice and, and, and to all these transit partners and tell them what our priority is. So in February, we passed a resolution unanimously declaring mass transit the highest priority in Day County. We followed that up in, in April with another resolution that I put forth, which was uh, the SMART plan, the Strategic Miami Area Rapid Transit Plan. And that is a plan that will provide the next level of connection, of transit connection in Dade County. A lot of cities like Miami Beach, like Miami, like Doral, are, um, and I don't want to get too much into the intercity uh, dynamics because I know you have your plan, your uh, uh, transportation director here, you have three city commissioners, so I don't need to get into that. But, but cities are doing a wonderful job, I have to say, with their trolley programs. They are, you know, our trolley is free in the city and I think we carry 350,000 riders a month. Uh, so it's, it's an extremely successful program. But it's not the solution for the city. It's sort of a band-aid uh, solution for us. Uh, for us, we're gonna have to have mass transit connectivity for us to be able to move people efficiently and effectively uh, countywide. So what we did in, in um, April was we passed a smart plan. The smart plan is six transit lines. It's the northern corridor along 27th Avenue from essentially the, uh, the stop in Hialeah of the Metro Rail all the way to the Dave Brower line. It's the southern corridor, which is the, the southern busway, which is a right of way that is currently in existence. It's the western corridor, which would connect FIU, Sweetwater, Doral to the Miami Intermodal Center, which is already connected to downtown. And it's, it's uh, south, and then of course it's it's the Bay Lake. And then there are two additional quarters, which is the FEC Coastal. The FEC Coastal will be coming out of the auto board station that is currently being built as we speak. We also did a, a deal in the city of Miami with the CRA to bring the tri-rail that currently exists and connects with the Miami Intermodal Center to connect it directly to downtown. So that that line would be activated. And it's a very, it was a very small, amount of money for the city to, to partner with all these different transit agencies, just on the capital side, or what I call phase three, which is execution. And execution takes on a multitude of different forms, and I think that's why forums like this one are eminently important to the decision makers who have to decide how we execute. And, you know, I can understand the beach's desire to, to push ahead because as a city commissioner, when we had, um, our transit director, uh, our for, former, now she's the Dade County Transit Director, Alice Bravo, she used to be our city manager. Um, we were trying to do something similar in the city to get our project moving forward. The reason why is because we're just desperate and people, our residents are desperate for relief. And, and, and the processes by which you have to engage in have a, a different set of time horizons. So for example, you hear about how are these projects going to be funded? Are they going to be federally funded? Or are they going to have some amount of federal funds? Or are they going to be funded through some combination of federal and state funds? And, and as Mark said, he's absolutely right. It gets extremely technical and extremely complicated um, to understand this. I've traveled the entire United States as a vice chair and seen all the different transportation systems, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Then there's obviously state, uh, I'm sorry, uh, county funding, which in many cases is the half cent, which as we all know, was not used as it was intended originally when it was passed in 2002, and we've gotten very little transit expansion for that. And so I think the big effort now from the CITT and from the county is what they call clawing back, although I don't really call it clawing back because it should have been there in the first place, but, but restoring the funds to provide capital improvements and capital expansion of the mass transit system. So that's the county system. And then of course local funding is important. I passed as a city commissioner um, the Miami Transportation Trust Fund where we put a certain portion of the monies that we generate, one-time monies, um, annual budgetary set-asides, uh, into a transportation trust fund so that the day that a county, the day that the federal government or anybody steps up and says, hey, we need another project for to alleviate transit in your city, we're ready to go. We can bond the money out or we can just write a check for the amount of money. We did the, the uh, port tunnel, 
which um, was funded 450 million by the state, 450 million by the county, and 50 million by the city of Miami. And so we need all kinds of relief when it comes to transit. We have a tremendous amount of density in the city, and we're committed to executing on the entire SMART plan. The devil, of course, is in the details, and the details are um, what many of you are looking for here. Um, what kind of transit uh, modality are we gonna have? Uh, what kind of technology? Technology drives price. Obviously, the you know certain kinds of technologies are more expensive than others. Heavy rail is extremely expensive. It's usually about $500 million a mile. In fact, the uh, orange line from the MIC to downtown was about $500 million for a mile. Um, light rail is about $50 million, 20 to $50 million per mile. Um, BRT is done at about 10 to 5, is it? Am I right on that, Jose? You want more, 100 million a mile? Okay, 100 million a mile. That's what I said, I said 20 to 50. That's what I said, that's what I said, a mile. Yeah, yeah, I said, I said, I said that, 20 to 50 a mile. So, um, and then you have BRT, which I think can be somewhere in the vicinity of five to 10 million a mile. But the issue that we have with BRT, and I'll just give, I'll go on my soapbox on BRT for two seconds, is this. We have 800 buses right now currently operating in Day County, 800. And as a percentage of the people who use mass transit to get to and from work as a community, as a county, we are at 12%. 12%. Copenhagen is at 50% of bikes <laughs> to and from uh, work. So, you know, to use, uh, you know, in terms of other cities across the country, you know, 12% is a woefully low number. And that's in part, I think, because there is a stigma to riding the bus. I think a lot of people feel that, you know, if you're riding a bus, you, you must be someone who just can't afford to have a car. And so what, what, what I think is imperative in our transportation system, whatever it may be in the future, is that it be a system that everyone rides. You know, it, that, that it be a system that all socioeconomic levels ride. And I think the successful ones in the world are that way. You'll see a CEO riding with, you know, someone who's a cook, you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a business. So I think uh, because it's effective, it's efficient, and it's inexpensive. And so that is what the county is seeking to do with the SMART plan. Obviously, it is difficult to do because it's extremely technical, it involves a lot of different governments, and you know what? It involves all of you. And it's very, very difficult in politics to make everybody happy. That's one of the most difficult things in the world that, that there is to do. But, but if you're good at what you do, and if you're an effective um, elected official, you'll listen, and you'll try to make the best decision to serve your residents. And that's certainly what we're trying to do. And yes, thank you for the opportunity thank you, to address you. Well. If I could just uh, a couple of sure. Sure. Is, is And I'll leave this here for you. That's great, and we really appreciate your comments. Could you share sort of what the current status is on the beach quarter in anything we know in terms of timing or when something would be decided or happen? What, what would you say on that? So obviously, you know, the, the beach has engaged in this process, which they'll explain, I'm yeah. sure, when they have an opportunity, which, which they procured uh, a light rail system for the, the uh, right of way that they've looked at. Yep. Um, clearly, we want to be cooperative in that in that system and have a system that will be, in my, my vision, and everyone has their own sort of vision of how these things happen, my vision would be hopefully that it would be some, some system that would connect the beach and the city both on 5th and on 41st because I think if you look at the traffic coming in and out, obviously um, rush hour, it's you know trying to get in or trying to get out is, is very, very, very difficult. Um, but in terms of how it gets funded and when it gets funded, it's a little difficult to say because that is exactly where we're at right now. In other words, we are in a, a sort of a battle, if you will, with all the different communities in Dade County and with the resources that we have to decide whether or not we finally go through a federal process, right, which could take six to eight years, um, depending on 
uh, how successful we are. By the way, the federal process, the reason why I have some issues with the federal process is you have to do a PD&E study, which, which are funded and which we're doing now for all six quarters. That takes about 24 months. And then you have to compete against everybody in the United States. And uh, there are many other cities in the US that are putting up a lot of their own money. Three cities right now in the US are in the process of a referendum for a half cent in those cities. And so what they do is they go to the federal government and they say, look, we have a bunch of our own local money and we want you to match what we have. So it's, it's, uh, it's a fierce competition because the issues that we're facing here in Miami and Miami Beach and in Dade County are the same issues that other cities are facing throughout the country. Thank you, Commissioner. Really appreciate your Thank time. You Big round of applause. Okay, we have a busy agenda, so we're going to keep rolling. We're going to keep rolling here. I'd ask the city to get set up. I also want to recognize our host tonight, Allison Colberg. Is uh, Allison with us here? Um, the the Miami Beach Women's Club is wonderful to allow us to uh, uh, have the opportunity to be here. They're so gracious. I just wanted Allison. She's going to come up just as the city's getting ready to, to take the field here. Um, and just say a word about our, our lovely host, Allison Bank. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Miami Beach Women's Club. I know a lot of you have been here before, but for those of you who haven't, I just wanted to tell you just for a minute or two about this amazing place. You're in a building that was built in 1933 for the women for the Miami Beach Women's Club, which actually was started in 1926. Uh, some women got together in 1926 after the Great Hurricane and they uh, reached out to the many people who had lost everything, and they reached out to help them, and they continued to meet and foster uh, friendship and community within the town of Miami Beach at that time. And uh, Carl Fisher, actually, his wife was involved, and he donated the land that this building was built on in 33, and they commissioned uh, Russell Pancos, the architect, to build the Miami Beach Women's Club. Uh, and it still stands today, as you see. It was restored, it was bought, purchased and restored by my boss, and Alan Lieberman and his wife, Diane. And uh, now we, it is no longer a woman's, there's no longer an active woman's club, but we use this beautiful building for parties, weddings, meetings, and any, any, any other special events. So it is um, a hall for hire. So if you know of anybody, or you yourself are planning a party, wedding, or meeting, or special event, please let me know. I have these cards at the entrance of the Women's Club, so when you leave, feel free to take one, and my contact information is located at the bottom. And I appreciate you appreciating this amazing building. So thank you for being here. Bye-bye. Thank you, Allison. Okay, from the city of Miami Beach, we have uh, Assistant City Manager Kathy Brooks, thank you for coming. Uh, Director of Transportation Jose Gonzalez is with us. Uh, Winsome Bowen, uh, Deputy of Transportation. Uh, from Kinley Horn, we have Rick Now and Alicia Gonzalez, and also Claudia Rodriguez from the city. We've asked the city to take 15 minutes, talk very succinctly for us, and basically we said, tell us what is this project of the light rail on Miami Beach? Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the cost involved, as best we know. Really importantly, how do residents get involved? How do we get our voices in that process? And of course, building on the presentation we just heard, we want to hear all about how this project might connect with the other project, and perhaps a word or two about why we may have two separate projects at this point. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Winsome and let you guys do your thing. Thank you, Mark. My name is Winston Bowen, and in addition to being the Deputy Director of Transportation, I'm also the City's Project Manager for this study. I, I am emphasize the word study, because that's what we're doing. A little bit about the background. Okay. And some of what I am going to say will echo a little bit of what Commissioner Suarez has shared with you. And I'll just keep talking in the meantime, because I don't need the picture. Um, this is a part of the former Bailey study that in fact has been around since 1985 or before, 1969. 
we've been talking about an effective public transportation connection between Miami Beach and downtown Miami for many decades. And usually in public transportation, we'll say there's nothing as great as an idea whose time has come. One of the key things that we need to move these public transportation projects forward across the country is political will. And as you can tell from the commissioner's delivery, there is indeed strong political will at this time because we recognize that we have a truly serious regional problem that needs to be addressed. I just want to point out that this is a work in progress. This is the planning stage. There are no decisions made at this point. There will be iterative steps where decisions will be made by the Commission and we're in the process of gathering all the technical and financial information so that our Commission or city leadership can make informed decisions. We're following the Florida Department of Transportation project development process which is typically used for all of these transportation projects regardless of mode, whether it's highway or transit. It also mimics the Federal National Environmental Protection Act, NEPA, which you've probably heard. And in that NEPA study, we look at several concurrent technical areas of um, study, such as we look at potential environmental <coughs> impacts, potential benefits, and any mitigation that may be required. We also look at potential impacts to the community, and we look at the technical feasibility of these studies. Interoperability is a key factor, in particular interoperability with the Beach Corridor Direct Connection Project that the Commissioner just described to us as part of the SMART plan. There are several decision points through this process. First of all, the Commission needs to consider a draft interim agreement. We are in an unprecedented project development process whereby we are doing a concurrent environmental clearance and yes, we are also in the procure procurement stage for a P3 developer or a P3 concessionaire. Um, this is typically not done usually, even internationally. A P3 concessionaire would not be brought on board until after the environmental studies are complete, however, the, city, the city's mayor decided that, and the commission decided that we needed to move forward on a solution because our need is very urgent. And so the policy executive committee that the commissioner referred to earlier decided that there should be two concurrent actions. One would be a federally funded project or a federally eligible project, the larger project which is from 41st Street in the Design District through downtown Miami and the MacArthur Causeway. And at the same time, there would be a locally funded action, which is the Beach Corridor Project. So we also received a, a non-solicited proposal, and that triggered, by, by Florida law, that triggered a series of actions in a certain time frame. The city had to respond, look at the technical uh, feasibility and the financial feasibility of that um, proposal and also invite um, competing proposals. We selected a first draft proposal in June and we're currently in negotiations. There are no decisions at this time, no commitments have been made and the city reserves the right at any time to cancel or terminate the, the conversation for convenience. As Commissioner Suarez said, uh, this is the uh, Beach Corridor Direct Connection Project. Uh, it shows the map where, with the, the line through Miami uh, coming across the MacArthur Causeway and into the city of Miami Beach. Uh, you can see the, the corridors of Miami Beach that we consider were 5th Street, Washington, 17th, and Alton. Uh, and this is not the first study of this type of connection through the city, to the city of Miami Beach. Uh, back in 1969, in the, in the city transportation plan, there was the, a recommendation for a rubber-tired electric trolley operating on an exclusive guideway. Um, as the commissioner mentioned, there was a 2004 study. 
that uh, looked at the transportation corridor, uh, the Bay Link study, and then it was updated in 2015, and that's the report that, uh, that we provided tonight. So the first thing that, that we do when we look at projects like this is we identify, well, why is this needed? What is, what is the purpose of this project? And the first thing is, it, it is the first link of this regional rail transit system. So this is, this is really to get the project jump started, moving ahead quickly. But more importantly, we're trying to improve mobility for the city of, uh, of Miami Beach, to move residents, workers, visitors throughout the South Beach area. We're also trying to provide an alternative uh, to vehicular travel. Right now, you don't have a whole lot of choices, and, and this would provide an alternative way of getting around. Finally, we're trying to support sustainable development. Sustainability is an important part of the city of Miami Beach, and this is a sustainable form of transportation. So these purposes respond directly to the needs that we see out here. And, and again, as mentioned by the commissioner, traffic congestion is increasing. And not only that, but it's severely constrained by the existing road system. The road system really can't be expanded. So we we're looking for alternatives that can accommodate like, additional uh, people moving capacity without, without uh, building more roads. Uh, the quality and reliability of the bus system is compromised by that traffic congestion. People can't, can't save any time. They find that the buses take more time, and, uh, and that's a, a problem for using the bus. The city wants to encourage smart and sustainable development. And that's, that's a need that exists, and maintaining a sustainable environmental balance is an extremely important part of the project. When we, when we look at uh, what the project consists of, we start, at, we start talking about the, uh, the, the, we started talking about a system that was very similar to what was identified in the, uh, the Bay Link study. So coming across the causeway to fifth, to Washington, uh, we were looking at Dade Boulevard and all, and this would be a uh, a system that, that is is entirely wireless. Um, this would use the latest technology for for a, a streetcar, so it would not have an overhead wire. Um, we would have center running tracks along most of the route, with a side running on the south side of Fifth. There would be stops located approximately every three miles. There would be a vehicle storage and maintenance facility on, on South Beach so that we could keep the vehicles out here and maintain them. Uh, finally, there would also be a bus rail intermodal transfer facility in the vicinity of all yeah. This is a, a picture of the vehicle storage and maintenance facility, which is almost across the street from this, uh, from, from this building. Uh, it would be integrated into the city public works building and, and would be a joint use site so that we would incorporate uh, the, the public works activities along with the vehicle storage and maintenance facility. The, uh, the, over, the cost for this project, uh, what we're looking at for a phase one project would just provide for the alignment along 5th and Washington. The estimated capital cost in 2016 dollars is about $245 million. Um, the annual operating cost is about $7 million. We're looking at a funding plan that's part of the process that we're going through right now is to develop a funding plan with about 50% of the funding coming from the county, from the city, 25% from the county. 12.5% from the state, and the remaining 12.5% is yet to be determined. Um, the, the cost of operating the system, uh, we're, we're estimating revenues from the fare box of about $2.8 million, and, and are identifying, still identifying where the additional operating costs can be found. The project development process um, is we're, we're working concurrently on a number of different items. We're working through this environmental process right now. That's, that's my primary role on the project, is to work through the, the environmental process. 
At the same time, we are conducting public outreach and we're, we're working on this project funding plan. And finally, we're also conducting uh, the, this P3 discussion with the, uh, the proposed builder of the system. Public involvement is an extremely important part of this whole process. As we mentioned, we are following the, the, the FDOT uh, public or pro project development process. And this includes documenting, uh, obtaining public comments, and incorporating those public comments into the decision-making process. So as we move forward with, with the, the decision making uh, at the commission level, we're anxious to get your comments and to incorporate them into our planning process. So we've held several um, stakeholder meetings and the city acknowledges that this has been, uh, it's, it's, it's a, not a, as ambitious as we would like this public involvement process to be, but we are ramping up starting in the next couple of weeks with meetings to stakeholder organizations, homeowners, uh, homeowner, homeowner associations, as well as formal public meetings. We're planning tentatively to hold our first public meeting November 15th, and public notification will be going out shortly to that effect. We're planning another formal public meeting in February, early next year, and a formal public hearing in April, which will indicate the finalization of the project environmental impact report. We also have social media by which we communicate with the community. We've had one Twitter event with um, city manager Jimmy Morales, and we're planning to have monthly Twitter events where people from different demographic groups in the community <coughs> can communicate to the city as to what this project or this proposed project is and how the process is conducted. And we're also moving out to North and Mid Beach, um, approaching those homeowner groups to share the project update and to hear your concerns. We have comment cards that we'd like to distribute in the back. And if you care to give us your early comments in writing, we'd like to see those because we do record all of the comments received. And in the question and answer period, we'll also be recording the questions so that we can keep track of where the information gaps are primarily with the community. And with that, we'll conclude the Thank you. brief presentation. Thank you so much, Winston. You guys did a nice job pulling that all in a short time. Uh, I'm sure there will be lots of questions. I'd just like to start with one. Sea level rise is a critical concern for the beach and obviously a lot going on. Given that the plan is light rail on the streets, could you just address sea level rise and how that would be incorporated? Absolutely. I'll ask um, Kathy Brooks to explain that in detail. And I'm really filling in because uh, Eric Carpenter is supposed to be here, but he's stuck in traffic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Eric, you want to do it? <laughs> It's just in time. As always. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Carpenter. I'm an assistant city manager and public works director for the city of Miami Beach. Uh, sorry I was running a little bit late, but uh, we have a very special guest in town this evening, and uh, he's kind of jammed up traffic a little bit. Um, we sat down in the very beginning phases of the assessment of this project and said, this is something that we certainly need to have around for 50 plus years. Um, in order to accomplish that, we basically looked at what's the minimum elevations that we need to set our tracks to be able to accomplish this. Um, we've decided that the tracks are going to be set at the same elevation as we're proposing to raise all of the streets of the city at 3.7 NAVD. Um, this is you know, approximately a foot and a half, two feet higher than the highest tides that we see during the King Tide event um, just last week. So you know, it's a significantly higher elevation than what we think would be impacted by groundwater or floodwaters at this point in time. Um, we're also looking at it from a resiliency and sustainability perspective because we're going to have to put pumps in. So we're looking at when we're tearing up these streets, do we have an opportunity to put 
the infrastructure in place, whether it be the stormwater infrastructure, our you know, stormwater main line that will be tied into the pumps, or the, um, the water and sewer lines that may be you know, 70, 80, 100 years old, need to be looked at for a replacement. Um, we're also looking at things like the tracks. These tracks need to be in service you know, 99, 100% of the time. So any pressurized lines that we may have, water mains, pressurized sewer mains, we've set up guidelines to make sure that these mains are crossing at a 90 degree angle from the tracks with a sleeve underneath them so that if anything were to happen, we would be able to dig down outside of the envelope of the track, replace the line by sliding it back through the sleeve, and then fill it back up without ever having to take the train offline. So we've looked at many different components of resiliency, and we're trying to build all of that into this project. I hope that answers the question. That, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, we're going to ask our panel to take the field here, and I'll be introducing them to get out. That, yeah, no, the uh, screen. So that's a lot of information quickly. I told you there was a lot to cover, but I'll, let me just take a second and make sure you're sort of tracking. We've got two different projects. It's part of the county's initiative. There's the Beach Corridor Project from 41st and 2nd of Miami, going through Miami and over the causeway. So that's the geography of that project. The county sort of driving that, the city of Miami involved. Then we have the Miami Beach project, and I think what we just heard, phase one would be 5th and Alton and make its way up Washington, and it goes in both directions, so we're talking about street level. The Miami Beach project is uh, talking about light rail, modern streetcar. The county project um, did not have that final determination. They, they're still talking about a few different things, so we'll, we'll hear that. Uh, I think it's fair to say they were more definitive plans that the city is moving forward with. The county is now starting their planning. But one of the big differences, I'm pretty sure it's fair to say, the city has decided not to pursue federal funding for this project, which has a elongated process. The county is still considering whether they want federal funding or not. So those are some important distinctions about these two projects, which are meant to so, about our panel tonight, a couple things I think are very important as I, I just introduced them. One uh, is that we wanted to give you a balanced perspective. You're, you've got some folks up here that think what you just heard is a very positive step forward and are very engaged. I think it's fair to say you can hear from some people who have some questions, and I think you'll probably hear some views that are not as supportive, in, and that might be putting it mild. We also have representatives from affected neighborhoods. Miami Beach United is a resident group. So we have folks from Sofna, the south of Fifth area. We have people from Flamingo Park. So we want to give you a diverse uh, set of opinions, and I think this group is set to do it. So let me do some introductions. To the far end, Mark Needle is a fellow board director of Miami Beach United. He is a leader in Flamingo Park. He has been after this light rail since the days of Bay Link. And I think it's fair to characterize him as an advocate for light rail as a mode of transportation. Next to uh, Mark, we have uh, Josh Levy. Josh is a, the vice chair of the Chamber of Commerce, also active in education issues, a resident of Miami Beach, and of course, this project will touch many businesses, particularly Washington Ave, so we're delighted to have Josh with us. Michael Barano is the president of the South of Fifth Organization, a group that's playing a leadership role to make sure that we get good information for, for residents. Uh, Daniel Morales, next to me, is a resident of Flamingo Park. He's a planner at DPZ because it's not just about transportation, but how it integrates, and importantly, Younger folks, millennials, if you will, have a great interest in mass transportation. So I think hearing from one might be a good thing. Robert Landsberg is a long-term resident of uh, Miami Beach, and he is the founder of a group called uh, Stop the Train, a, a Facebook group. So uh, I'll let him articulate his, his 
refuse and admit it, but that's in his, his group as well. So let's get into it. We've got about a half hour with this group. I'm going to start with my fellow director, Mark, and, and then we'll go down the, the line here with a fairly simple question. You heard the presentations from the county and the city. The question is, what are your thoughts? And in a nutshell, are we on the right track? Mark Needle. Hi. I'm um, not so comfortable being uh, supporting uh, a city project uh, without reservations, so I'm going to bring up some reservations. But uh, about 15 years ago, we were fighting off a lot of projects that weren't a good fit for Miami Beach, like a uh, big, big rail with a tunnel was the first one, and then we switched it to a bay link focus to integrate the two densest pedestrian areas in Florida, Miami, and Miami Beach. Um, the, uh, there was a lot of talk about bringing overhead systems into Miami Beach, which would have been incompatible with the historic ambiance uh, here. Uh, there was talk about going the other direction with something uh, that was not so permanent, uh, the tire uh, bus uh, system. I think we ended up with the right mode of choice. It was a long, multi-year debate that ended up with uh, uh, actually changing of decision by the commission to finally approve this a certain plan, and then um, later the public endorsing that plan. So I want to point out um, a couple of things that are different from the plan that was approved, and also raise attention to uh, the uh, a key part, which I'm thank thankfully hearing tonight, the idea that this plan is not just being pushed along, but actually the residents are, and the neighborhood organizations are going to have a substantial input opportunities into shaping this plan. Um, and uh, so the, when I looked at the uh, comp plan, and, and sure enough, the uh, uh, protect preservation of neighborhoods includes an element that uh, the public must be involved in the transportation process. Key stakeholders, which includes neighborhood organizations, need to be, shall be included at the early stages to ensure that uh, involvement, flexibility, and exploring solutions, openness to new ideas. I think everybody needs to know that these are your rights under the comp plan. Um, uh, this is our legal document that protects us. Um, and so we shall play an important role in identifying uh, issues and solutions that balance the needs of stakeholders. So let me just point out, I mean, I strongly believe that uh, a world-class city, which Miami Beach aspires to be, uh, and in some ways is, uh, needs to have world-class or at least decent transit, something better than just buses and, and, and traffic -y, uh, uh, car lanes. So uh, looking at the plan, which was a figure eight, a seamless loop around the two uh, places that have the most pedestrian uh, interest, uh, the streetcar plan, by the way, in Miami Beach and Miami is historically correct. In the 30s and 40s, we had streetcars, which is why it's bring back streetcars uh, from our point of view. Um, Flamingo uh, Park is in the center, and there was always a lot of people who really strongly got the idea of using a system like this. Um, but there are differences between the plan, and uh, this is just one third of a plan. Uh, I saw a big black dot where this Miami Beach loop connects to the rest of the system. And I have a real concern about that because the idea was that we seamlessly connect to downtown where the, ma the major intermodal center should be. Uh, that is a concern. Um, it, this plan jumps right from mixed right-of-ways to exclusive right-of-ways. That's something that I think would happen over time, but it needs to be uh, discussed how that would work in the short term. Um, and uh, certainly over the causeway, it's going to be exclusive. Um, and a couple other points, neighborhood groups have been raising questions and I think it just needs to be made really clear that they need to be engaged, their questions need to be answered. I have questions about compatible development, uh, if, whether this is going to lead to increases in development around the system, um, including at the sites of, of, of certain stations. Uh, I think those, those, the compatibility with neighborhoods is essential. Um, where parking garages are located is essential. I'll note that Mid-Alton 
is it in need of some of the public garage and that's Mark, not on the plan? Mark, you gotta leave these guys a little bit. <laughs> and that's okay. There are other questions. <laughs> He's got a lot of questions. Josh. Yeah. First of all, for those who don't know me, my name is Josh Bellini and I'm Vice Chair of the Mind Beach Chamber of Commerce. But um, along with my wife, uh, we're also raising our children here and they're our third generation going through our public schools. So I'm a double stakeholder in this issue. Uh, when this was presented to the Chamber, it actually raised more questions and issues than were answered. Uh, so what the Chamber did, and I'm going to read you our motion, we sent Jimmy Morales, our city manager, a motion, which really shows what the Chamber's thinking and our, our position. Whereas the, and I'll go back and start off by saying we are in favor of some type of system. So the motion says, we've gone on record as supporting public transportation and a system that connects Miami Beach to Miami. A transportation system needs to be implemented, but it has to be flexible, scalable, and adaptable to changing conditions in technology. We strongly encourage the city of Miami Beach to immediately and fully vet all alternate systems, including light rail, streetcar, and rubber rail, in determining the right system that will be fiscally responsible for our community, which will interact with the inner model system and incorporate consideration of all interested stakeholders before making any final decision. You guys don't want to listen. Go outside. So that, that was our motion. We actually haven't circled back to be able to discuss the answers since uh, we had a little hurricane scare there, uh, but we will be. Um, as, as Mark said, this is only a third of the plan, and as Commissioner Suarez also said, the devil's in the details. We as a chamber want to see those details before we either approve or disapprove of what's going to happen to our city. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike uh, Barano, uh, representing the South and Fifth Neighborhood Association. Um, I, I think I, I agree with Josh that at this moment we have vastly more, uh, more questions than answers. Uh, our approach to uh, helping, uh, helping the South of Fifth residents uh, with that was to ask a series of questions. Um, and we did that back at the end of August. Um, many of you, are, I think, are on our, our newsletter list and maybe saw some of those questions. Um, we thought that would be the start of a process. We were uh, Commissioner Greco took the time to uh, to answer those questions. We really appreciate that and the thoughtful responses. Um, beyond that, we didn't get much in the way of responses. Um, so we, we're, we're left uh, with, with a lot of questions. Um, as I would like to ask as a follow-up, uh, just real quickly, this is one of the things that's on my mind in particular. Uh, we spent $300 million to raise a few streets um, to this NAB D level uh, that you mentioned. I'm imagining Fifth Street, Washington Ave, Alton, uh, that's got to cost billions to raise those streets to that same level. Uh, am I, what, what am I missing here? If, and then and, and one of our questions related to this, which didn't get answered, if we raise only the center portion where the train is going to uh, to run, uh, don't we create a pedestal in the middle of the road that's impassable? Uh, I, I, I just can't get it to work in my head, not only from a from a cost standpoint, and, and why in this world would we build a train on the ground uh, at current level? That, that, would, that would be, uh, we, we know we have sea level rise to, to deal with, so, so uh, it, it, I don't know what you have in the way of an answer for that. If you'd like me to answer, I'm happy to. Sure, Eric, if you would, take a shot at that one. And I'll try and face everybody, but I'll try the answer to the question. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. On Washington Avenue, we're already at an elevation at the ground of road of 3.7. So on Washington Avenue, we wouldn't be looking at a significant raising of the street. You would maybe have some blending uh, to keep it at 3.7 if it had dropped a little bit below in a specific intersection. Uh, most of the um, concern is really at the cross streets, making sure that you can harmonize and allow for vehicles to turn uh, to access the cross streets. How about the other streets? And then on Dade Boulevard, we actually have 
Some components of Date Boulevard are significantly higher than that. There are other components of Date Boulevard that are lower. We would certainly expect that the county would be a participant in that, just like they are at Date and Purdy, since that's a county road. And likewise with Fifth Street, we're working with the state on many road raising <laughs> projects, currently on Indian Creek. The, the state has committed $20 million to raise Indian Creek along with installing the pump system. We would follow that same protocol with Fifth Street. Thank you. Uh, we have several thoughtful questions that we've asked uh, along these lines. This would have been a wonderful, uh, we would have appreciated this answer very much uh, to our questions. So thank you all very much. Okay, Daniel. Can you hear me? No. Uh, wow, uh, public speaking, one of my biggest fears. We need to jump snake and a shark to complete the bypass. So, um, has he indicated I'm an urban designer, so I deal with the daily uh, process, how we get around and we go through going to work, going home, and uh, just it's what we live with every day. And uh, so I deal with this, I work all the time. So let me zoom out a little bit on the lightweight project. I am supportive of connecting the, the mainland to South Beach. This, and this is what I've always complained since I landed in Miami five years ago. Now, like uh, Javier Suarez um, mentioned, the, the devil's in the details. I am not willing to throw in all my support if the street designs uh, they propose will um, be built that way. For example, on I went to a open house this summer uh, where Kim Lee Horn um, presented the project and I was able to see all these three statues, how they move around travel lanes, uh, parking lanes, the street, uh, street trees, and so forth. And I've seen that on Alton, Alton Road, for example, they propose keeping the two lanes traffic along with the light, light rail. And that would mean that the sidewalk would be cut in half from 20 feet to 10 feet, and the parking lane would be taken out. So you would step out of the store, take a few pages, and we have fast moving traffic. Now, um, I live on I live in Flamingo Park and I've been involved in um, in the design of a better auto road. It's our main street. It's where we go to the supermarket, the pharmacy, it's 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 out, it's for the locals. So we move mountains to extend the sidewalk to so buy taking out that sidewalk and incentivizing uh, driving to negating the effect of the light rail. And it's frankly embarrassing to see that they consider that, um, that street session. In other locations, for example, in uh, Washington Avenue, they have a series of proposals. And in, um, in two of them, they take out the parking lanes. So that's the same issue. And um, so with that day, it's part of the couple of design uh, issues or mistakes I've seen are many. And um, so let's step back for a minute. I think the city and the engineers have to 
chapter and list of um, uh, principles in street design and uh, really simple. I I think the the first one, the most important one, would be uh, prioritizing pedestrians. So if, if you don't have any pedestrians, you're not going to have anybody using the light rail. So by, by prioritizing uh, walkability, we need wide sidewalks without any obstructions. All of you know, when we walk along our streets, we have samples in the middle of the sidewalk. You have to, if you're walking with your partner or if I'm walking with my mom, I have to step out of the way to let someone through. It's, it's not it's not designed for pedestrian while the street is extremely wide. So that's the first one. The second one is we have to enhance connectivity. We, we cannot cut off connections. Like in, in Autumn World, they um, put some concrete islands where you cannot cross the street. So what, what it does is, as a pedestrian, if I see that island, I would either have to walk down the block, find a crosswalk, cross over, and then walk down again, or I would cut the street legally. So, the third one, I'm sorry, the, the last one. So the last one is to incentivize alternative methods of transportation. So you have to make uh, biking pleasurable. You have to um, maybe make some of the budget free like, or affordable, like Abhi Tuarish mentioned with the police. You have to, if you propose a light rail, you have to make it something everyone wants to use. And if it's not a zero sum game, you need to make it successful. So these are the devils and the details I found. And I hope moving forward from here, we can adhere to those principles to make it a successful project. Good evening, everyone. My name is Robert Landsberg. I started the Facebook campaign, Stop the Train Miami Beach, 10 weeks ago. When I first learned this project, and that it's a done deal, and we don't need the public's vote from Commissioner Grieco, I was shocked. A four-seventh vote could decide such a large project that involves so much money and little or no public engagement. Well, it can. Our charter allows it. Streetcars have been installed in Oklahoma City, Kansas City, Phoenix, Tucson, Cincinnati, Tampa, and Atlanta. The jury is out, and so are the ridership numbers. Atlanta and Tampa streetcars have an average of 600 riders per day. <laughs> the argument that it will take cars off the road is a false claim and one used to sell this product. There is nothing modern about streetcars. Uber, Google, Lyft, and Apple, corroborated by the insurance industry and MIT, are telling us that the transportation revolution has started and will accelerate faster than most of us can imagine. Without a public vote, we the residents will sacrifice the following. $400 million, $20 million a year to run it, 25 acres of city streets and property. Hundreds of businesses along the route will suffer during the long construction process. Our quality of life. The precious small town and pedestrian friendly feel of South Beach replaced with, replaced with six railroad tracks and train stops. Imagine Washington and Alton minus 24 feet so a train can run in a circle. Sea level rise and iron tires. How can we possibly quantify the expense associated with Mother Nature and those uncertainties? Let's look to San Antonio, Texas. 
the only city that has successfully defeated the streetcar. They ran a ballot initiative and fixed their city charter to ensure the citizens get a vote to decide on the laying of tracks in their city streets. I ask everyone to please join me in support as I follow the formula applied in San Antonio. We need 4,500 registered voters to sign a petition to change our city charter. Please review the ballot language that I brought with me tonight and I will distribute after and share your comments with me. And if you'd like to volunteer towards the effort, that would be appreciated. There is a presidential vote shortly, an opportune moment to gather the signatures required. The question is simple. Do you want a right to vote on the streetcar project? Yes. yes. and we certainly are. Two, two things I do want to follow up. Robert quoted some numbers, and I guess I'm your sort of fact checker here. You heard a $400 million number. I think that number was if we had the two phases combined. To be clear, the number uh, on the table is $244 million. That's for the project as defined. That's fifth and Alton, phase one, to go up uh, Washington. So just to be clear where, where the numbers are. I think Robert... It does or does not? Does, does not. Robert also made a point that I think is a couple of very interesting things. You know, this is a conversation playing out across the country. Um, Cincinnati, in September, just uh, adopted their, their train and are up and running. San Antonio is an example where residents you know, basically said no. And in Virginia Beach, uh, literally next month, they're voting on a referendum. This conversation has been happening around the U.S., so it's exciting for us to have the chance. I want to ask the panel to respond to Robert's comment about alternatives. He mentioned driverless cars. Uh, we've heard the term BRT, bus rapid transit, where you dedicate a lane to a bus, you let people prepay, sort of a much more enhanced bus. We have trolleys coming. Uh, does anyone on the panel want to comment on alternatives? Michael. I, well, not, specific, not any specific alternative, but, uh, but I think my perspective on this, why are we not talking about it in, to, in, in its total, you know, in the total solution, and why are we, why are we talking specifically about a train? Uh, Politics. <laughs> okay. Um, so, above my pay grade, right? Um, but uh, I, I think, it, for, it gets interesting to me as we start talking about a, a, a total solution, a mobility solution. Uh, I live at First in Washington, and what, how am I going to use this? You know, I can get Uber in less time than it takes me to get down the elevator. The Uber driver's out there. Five dollars later, I'm on Lincoln Road. Five minutes, five dollars later, I'm on Lincoln Road. So there, there are so many. I uh, like Robert's uh, transportation revolution. Uh, my son is in college. Sends me articles all the time about driverless cars, you know, and, and, and there, are, there are, you know, there's so much that's out there, and I just wonder, are we exploring? Are we exploring any of this? Are we just, did we decide to be great? And why? And, and this is part of the questions that, that, we, that we asked. I would like to see an integrated mobility solution yeah. and not, not so much emphasis on a train. Maybe the train's a part of it. I'm open minded. I try to be open minded about that. Um, Robert's not. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, that's right. Mark, did you have a thought? Yeah, just quickly, the, the more transportation, the better. Uber plus uh, a streetcar is a great uh, combo. Uh, the change of taking South Point off of the loop actually is a change from the plan that was voted on uh, 12 years ago. And I think, uh, you know, the commission can decide to have it voted on, um, so it doesn't even require that. I think that's a good idea. When you have a plan that actually makes sense, people will vote for it just as they did before. In fact, this plan is a little better because it doesn't even have wires. If the route is correct, then the cost is correct. Josh? As I said before, the chamber does support some type of public transportation that links Miami Beach to the city of Miami. But it has to be sensible, scalable, and adaptable. It actually has to improve the quality of life for all the residents of Miami Beach, as well as the businesses of Miami Beach. It has to make sense. Uber was brought up. 
That makes sense. It's user friendly and it reduces traffic. This train has raised so many issues. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> uh, in, in New York, they have a select bus service. Uh, it has dedicated lines, uh, priority and signals, limited stops, increased speeds, and it actually reduced the queue time for the people who use it. No alternative should be off the table. That's why we said in our motion that we need to vet everything. If we're gonna go down this road, everything should be on the table. Everybody should be involved, from the businesses. We don't know what's gonna to happen to our businesses, and I'm not talking about the big ones. I'm talking about the small mom and pop restaurants who will not be able to survive if they're out of work for two years or whatever it is while the construction is going on. That has to be addressed, and it should be addressed at the beginning, not at the end. I just have one last question for the panel, because we want to hear from our residents. If you were sitting out there and you had thoughts and concerns, what should the residents, both individually and collectively, do to make sure their voice is heard? To make sure their voice is heard. Mark. Talk to Robert. We need to uh, ask or demand that the commission establish a process uh, that formally uh, provides neighborhood organizations the ability to vet and provide input into this plan as neighborhood associations, in addition to the, the individuals commenting on the plans. That's what I would recommend. Thoughts down here? My thoughts are, and I attended yesterday's commission meeting, it's very intimidating to stand up in front of a commission at a commission meeting, speak your mind. Obviously this commission is pretty hardened on this concept. I'd like to also add that all the presenters here tonight, including the city of Miami Beach, are a member of the Streetcar Coalition of America. Streetcarcoalition.org is the website, city of Miami Beach, AECOM, Lee Kimberly Horn. So when we think we're gonna get a fair environmental report for the $5 million that we spent, we're not. We're gonna get a streetcar report. And the staff that the city has hired is to further a streetcar program, nothing else. That 100-page piece of paper done by Gannett Fleming there that Commissioner Suarez presented to update to a 2004 report. And if you read the second page of it, it's amazing what they did not do. And they made it very clear that they were dis 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 disclosing that. Uh, part of my experience passing out my flyer, which I think you all got tonight, was I did bump into an employee of Gannett Fleming. And she was quite shocked that the city had gone ahead with the environmental report based on what they did not do. So uh, in, unless we have a public referendum and we all get a vote the right way, to do a $500 million project in a city and a town as small as this, I don't believe that we'll really be fairly hurt no matter how many of these meetings we have. And based off the energy that I'm seeing from the city and from the mayor, and from the commissioners. Okay, well I'm not sure if we'll have I'm not sure who will be heard when, except you guys are gonna get heard now. I do want to acknowledge I saw Commissioner Kristen Rosen Gonzalez is with us. Thank you for joining us, Commissioner. And I understand also I see Commissioner uh, Mickey Steinberg is here. Thank you for coming, Commissioner. So what we want to do now is use the balance of our time to hear from you. I have a very simple request. If you're going to ask a question, make it a question. We've got a lot of interest in the room. Please be brief and we'll do our best to answer uh, as many questions as possible. My uh, last request is some of you guys are veterans, have heard these presentations before. I'm welcome to hear your view, but it might be nice to get some folks, maybe they're new to this conversation, to go. With that, I'm open for business. I hear you see a hand over here. Yeah. Okay, what's your question? Well, I, uh, first of all, the local cost 25 cents, the trolley is free. How much will light rail cost for a person to ride it? And there's a lot of people in the community that don't have a lot of money. Winston, what's the best understanding of the cost per ride? 
We haven't decided on a cost yet. Okay. We are doing projections at this time, considering various uh, costs from zero to a dollar twenty-five per ride. But so, no decision has been made about the cost. That will be a, a commission decision in in conjunction with the county. Okay. So zero to one twenty-five is the rough range at this point. Yes. Correct. Okay. Got it. Next. Hi, my name is Paula King. I'm from North Beach. I have two, if I can. One is the working class of Miami Beach lives in North Beach. Mm -hmm. Those are usually the most ridership. Why is North Beach not included in any transportation plan? So that one first. Okay. So here's the question. The question was, um, there, there's a significant working class population in North Beach that might be open to mass transit. Why are they not included in phase one or phase two and it's just South Beach? We're, we're going from the 2004 study that was refreshed in 2016 in February. Um, phase one, what, what we did not tell you today because of, of, of time limitations is that Last night we presented a recommendation to split the project and go for phase one only. Fifth Street to Washington. We don't know where phase two will be, but there's been a conversation internally to potentially go further north, and that is consistent with our transportation master plan. Okay, question here. My question is, who is your target user? Is it the homeowner? Or is it the business, oh, is it someone frequenting business? Is it people coming here to go to businesses? Or is it homeowners that are going to work downtown? Who's your target user? Good question. Everyone. Everyone who needs to get around. Residents, business owners, visitors, everyone. We're, we're, we're looking for modes that will attract new riders onto the system and create more equitable distribution of trips across modes. Winston, if I could follow up, I get everyone, and we certainly would have residents and visitors, but is there a sense of the mix? Would it be more one than another? Who's sort of the core is, I think, what the question is. The people coming over here, us going over there, and how, because that's, a very, that's the business area, and there, as was mentioned, the residents are all in North Beach, so it would make more sense to me that if it went, if you needed one, it would go across 41st Street to connect with the design district and Wingwood over there. I agree. I, don't know. I agree. And I just want to point out that our transportation master plan calls for dedicated transit lanes in North Beach, through to North Beach, and we're starting somewhere. We are acknowledging that there is a need throughout the community, and we're targeting any person who wants to use an alternative mode of transportation. I also want to just take this opportunity to point out that we have looked at other, prior studies have looked at other modes. Um, and we'll be documenting that in our environmental impact report. Just to be clear, there will be documentation of other modes, but this study, if I understood right, has the policy of pursuing light rail, not really assessing other alternatives. Is that accurate? That's true. Okay. Light rail or streetcar that would operate like light rail in that it would be an exclusive right of way in order to provide a higher, the highest possible level of service for the transit user. Okay, great, let me keep going. One quick question and one little more lengthy question. The quick one is, if a person transit, transits from the local loop to the cross causeway, would that same fare take him to Miami? That's a quick question. The more complex one is I share with the thoughts. To me, common sense, 41st Street splits Miami Beach. I think it makes, and I'm totally in favor of the rail, but I think it makes no sense where it's currently planned. Exactly. So, so there were two questions, I think. One was, would the fair take someone all the way around Miami Beach and over the causeway? Is, would that be a single fair? And then the second, uh, I think, was an observation. Why aren't we focused on 41st, which is such a thorough fair and divides Miami Beach? 
So I'll answer the third question. That has not yet been determined. We, we just started our conversation with the county, and we will be, as, as the study proceeds, we will be developing a fair structure, a fair policy program. But it has to be fair, F-A-I-R, and equitable. And the, do you want to touch the 40, anything else on 41st Street as a major thoroughfare? Any rationale for not being there at this point? There is, there is absolutely a rationale. As a matter of fact, the uh, MPO study does uh, propose future extensions of north through 41st. But the reason why the MacArthur, time and time again, the MacArthur comes out as the, 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 the corridor to initiate the first connection between downtown Miami, because that's where the regional mature mass transit system exists in downtown. So the quickest way to get from downtown to South Beach, which is an international destination, is through the Arthur Cosmos. So that's the, 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 the rationale. Okay, hey, hey, hang on now. Let's do, we, we're getting some answers. Alan, Alan it, is, it is workers too. I would be there. Alan Zinkin lives out the fifth. So a lot of the traffic that we have in Miami Beach is flow through traffic. It is not necessarily the loop, the business loop. And again, Uber handles that, people walking handles that, drive, uh, uh, bicycles handle that quite well in, within the 20 block radius. But it's flow through. It's people that don't necessarily live here. They drive across one causeway, ride along Beach, Collins, or Ocean Drive, or whatever, drive out the other causeway, or keep going further north. Um, and it's constant. You know, that's really, this doesn't solve the major traffic issues that we have out there. Can I just jump in? Yeah. So, Go ahead, Josh. Alan is absolutely correct. Uh, the Miami Beach traffic, and I say this personally, not as vice chair, that's just let me say that. Um, as someone who lives in Mid Beach, our traffic problem is not just a Miami Beach problem. Our traffic problem is in Aventura, Surfside, Bay Harbor, Bell Harbor, City of Miami. So when you have a train system that doesn't, says it's dealing with traffic, but doesn't really go towards fixing our traffic problem, you have to wonder. Uh, it provides an alternative to being stuck in traffic for those who can use the transit. That's the point of it, is that you can get to places and the tourists can come here without bringing cars. So it's not a replacement for it doesn't solve all the traffic problems in the world. It provides a reliable way to get around, even though the traffic is going to continue to get worse and worse. Okay. One, one, one thing to understand, and um, you cannot build the way out of traffic at all. To add another layer that meets it in two you will create traffic by building more lanes, more, uh, uh, increasing the, the, the right so black rail is a way to provide an incentive to use another method of transportation like heat tech. So if you want to avoid traffic, get on the black rail. Okay, let's hear from some more residents. Okay, so I heard a comment earlier that the working class lives in North Beach, okay? I'm working class, I live in South Beach, I rent an apartment I don't own. Um, I live there because it's the closest commute to my downtown. So my question is, um, as far as numbers, have you guys looked at who's commuting from downtown to, from, from Miami Beach, South Beach to downtown and vice versa? Because I know there's a lot of traffic coming across the causeway in the morning, coming onto the beach that could potentially utilize it. And I want to know what the numbers are associated with that. So as part of the MPO study, we, we, we did look at the number of, of trips, how many originate Miami Beach, downtown Miami, and it was, it was actually quite impressive. Just across the MacArthur Causeway, on a daily basis, 17,000 people take the, the buses, the, the county buses, the S bus, the, the L, all those routes. 17,000 people. That's more than on some light rail systems. On a, on a system that's not, you know, it's not very uh, up to date. It, it's not even very reliable at times. So what this will do is it will upgrade that that system, that connection to a more reliable, a more modern, and and, and efficient uh, system. 
Jose, can I ask a follow-up to that question? Uh, Mark, I'm sorry. Hold on one second, Michael. Hang on one time. Sorry, I just had a follow-up, which is, I mean, you talk about the buses. I, right now, I drive to and from. I would love to have an opportunity to not have to drive every morning. But that just doesn't exist. So that's what I meant as far as people commuting by car. The cars that we're trying to take off the road, do we have an estimate of the numbers? Not saying that everyone's going to take it. Do we have an estimate of people that are commuting via car to and from downtown on a daily basis? Commuting, I'm not sure. I know that 100,000 people a day take the... Uh, the MacArthur, the MacArthur Causeway. It's a, well, it's about ninety-six thousand. Okay, Michael, you had a thought. Yeah, uh, I mean, as I talked, as we talked to to folks about this who have concerns, um, uh, you know, the level of interest in this this uh, light rail idea goes completely away uh, if you take away the connection to uh, to Miami. And we had some folks come to. Uh, one of our committee meetings from the county and left with a really distinct impression that that, that connection is years and years and years away. Uh, that it's really not, it's, it's, it's not at all uh, inevitable. So I don't know how, if you want to respond to that, but but I, I can just tell you that, that um, I don't find anybody interested in this project unless it's connected to, to, uh, to the mainland. And, and ultimately, that is that is the goal. Okay, you gotta here. start. You gotta start ultimately. somewhere. And we cannot control what happens over there. But we, at least, as far as things that we can do in our city to improve mobility, we're trying to do that. But so we can hope it could be twelve years before that's connected, based on their budget, from people that work the in the anyway. process. So we're gonna have a train going in a circle for twelve years that we pay four hundred million dollars for. It'll take 10 years to do it. Yeah. Hang on, one conversation. Wait a second, do you want to, do you want to address that? Yes. Yeah. I think it is an important issue. We've heard about the county's plans. We, we understand this project is sort of fast-tracking, but clearly there's concern of that issue. Could you talk to that a bit? So we understand the concern about the connection over the MacArthur Causeway, and we are in discussions with the county to investigate what kinds of interim high capacity premium transit we can implement on the MacArthur Causeway, acknowledging that these projects take time. If we, Miami County and the City of Miami, decide to embark on the federal process, as the Commissioner said, it is competitive, we compete nationwide. It takes time to complete the environmental studies with the public involvement, that is a mandatory part, of course. And so it's probably several years before it's built. We could attempt to fast track it, but even then, it's probably a minimum of five years. So in the meantime, we are in discussions about implementing an interim high capacity premium transit service across the causeway. However, I just wanted to tell you that our study team has been working on projections of possible ridership, and they're using the model that's used by the Federal Transit Administration, a very conservative model. And so far, we've seen numbers between six to 10,000 riders per day on just the Miami Beach portion, because we have to look at potential ridership in order to help us to determine whether this is indeed a worthwhile investment of public funds. So, Winston, if I, I could follow up then, if the county proceeds pursuing federal funding, so that means that process is elongated, do we still believe that this project on a standalone base has enough merit and ridership that we would proceed? We're in the process of determining the answer to your question. Okay, that's a fair one. Okay, I'm making my way around the loop here and I saw someone back here. For the record, my name is Tanya Bada, I'm a 13-year resident and I live in North Beach after having spent most of the time in Mid-Beach. Um, I love the idea of functional public transportation and sorely lacking. I think this program as it is currently envisioned is not the solution by a long, long stretch. So I have a follow-up question to the point made that without um, connectivity to the city of Miami, this really has no purpose. If that is the case, for which I believe most residents feel pretty strongly that that is indeed the case, 
why is this project being fast-tracked to a um, company that solicited us, that is on the record for being investigated for bribery, and which has closed bid, and which has proprietary technology? Who's agitating that we are so desperately in need of a, another train to go in a circle when we have a trolley and a, a, the shuttle? So I think it makes no sense. That's a heavy question. So nobody is agitating. As as we said earlier, the mayor decided that and the mayor. Hold on. Let the truth be known. Let's be respectful. Hold on. Hold on. The question was raised. Let's please allow our professionals to respond. To move forward with the first stage of a regionally significant mobility project. We have an immediate need here on Miami Beach. We're in the process of determining through robust technical studies. And as the project manager, my role is not to advocate for anything. It's to ensure that our consultants give us the highest quality product, most thorough studies. We're in the process of assessing whether there is indeed a definable need that would confirm or not confirm whether this project should be moved forward. Can you address the part about At the time, we have no commitment to anyone. We're but in the process. Who the city is talking to. Who made the unsolicited bid? Yeah. I guess I get the phone one, huh? Uh, for those of you who don't know me, Kathy Brooks, Assistant City Manager. Um, the city did receive an unsolicited proposal from Greater Miami Transit Partners, um, pursuant to state statute that um, we put out a solicitation that opened it up for other proposals. It went through a ranking by an evaluation committee and Greater Miami Traveling Partners did end up ranked number one. There were other two other proposals that were received that were ranked two and three. And um, the recommendation was to go forward with number one. In the manager's due diligence based on that evaluation committee, he did look at the issue of um, there was a complete background track on all of the provide of all of the proposals, and that was taken into account. They looked at um, the compliance provisions that have been put in place as a, in regards to Alstom, which is one of the members of Greater Miami Traveling Partners that um, I believe were being referred to. But other proposals dealing in international environments also had issues that were of concern. So when you're going out and you're looking at all of this, there, are, there is a possibility that you're going to find those concerns when you start doing those background checks. But we did go through and review the compliance provisions that they put in place, and the manager felt comfortable moving forward with the recommendation of the evaluation team. And just as a point of information, Alston's based out of France, Subsequent to Miami Beach proceeding with them, I believe they were awarded a federal project by the U.S. government uh, for Amtrak. Is that correct? That is 2. correct. Two point seven billion, Mark. Yeah, a big one. Two point seven billion, that's and correct. that came okay. after this yeah, decision. That, that's recent. Yeah. Okay. We got a few more questions. Louis, did you have a go for it? Yes. Louis Baudet, and I don't know if this is your question or a question for you, Winston, and specifically since you brought something else up, or for Eric, perhaps, but. Um, the most important thing for me is, could you describe the track itself? We're talking about the metallic parts of it, everything about the track, that's part one. And then something else you raised, you said exclusive right of way. So in other words, we're not gonna be sharing uh, with automobiles any part of the roadway? So I'll answer the easy planner one first, <laughs> the second one. Exclusive rights of way, meaning the only vehicle that will be on that track is the proposed rail. However, I should say, because the police did ask this question, in times of emergency, what happens when you have an emergency, you have an emergency, and these vehicles, if it's built, communicate, they're in real time, instant, con co constant communication, and a vehicle would be able to ride on, an emergency vehicle would ride on those tracks. But I'll have our consultant describe the track itself. 
the, the, tracks, the tracks are steel rails. They're embedded into the street um, so that they're, it's, it's essentially a smooth surface that you can easily walk over. Uh, there's a groove in the street where the, the flange on the wheel fits in uh, for, from the streetcar. Uh, that. Yeah. Yeah. Is it wide enough for a bicycle tire to get caught into? Bicycles, bicycles are a, a, an issue and, and have to be addressed as part of the design process. Yes, they are. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it, it, has been, it has been a concern and, and bicycle routes need to cross the tracks perpendicular. You don't want people riding on the tracks because that groove is, is a potential so hazard. If I were to ride up Washington, I would have to make sure that I wouldn't be anywhere close to where that groove could be because I could just get caught into that groove, fall, and even perhaps get caught by a train. Like that's happened yeah, how fast is the train going to go? That was my question. The, the train will move. The average travel speed is about 12 miles an hour. Um, it, yeah. It's, it, I mean, it's going to be operating in an exclusive right of way, and, and you know, you can say 12 miles an hour, that's not much, but you look at the adjacent traffic, and it, it will be faster than the adjacent traffic. Well, no, it's traffic. fast enough for a child or a dog or something to get in front of it. Well, this, uh, the, the safety of these, 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 the design of these systems, safety is absolutely paramount. These systems are designed to stop very quickly, they're, they're, they are designed to be, that's one of the reasons why we're looking at exclusive right-of-way. You will know when you enter that, that, that right-of-way. And in fact, in other cities where these, these systems have been introduced, at first it is a concern, and there, there needs to be special. We've got to start somewhere, and it's an expensive system. We wish we could take it all through the city, all the way to North Beach. That would be my dream come true. But we've got to start somewhere. Okay, a few more questions. We're up against our clock. Hi, good evening. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm just curious, is the city budgeted the cost of raising the roads in this project? Um, I'm not sure what the total cost of Sunset Harbor was or is. It's still in process, and I think it's been in process for about two years now. It's a very small neighborhood, and every single, pro every single property has been affected in its own way. So I can't imagine raising the roads in Alton, Washington, how it will you know, be effective for each property owner. So I'm curious if the city has looked into these costs yet. I can say absolutely we have looked at the costs associated with raising the roads on this track. Um, but what I will tell you is that, at least at this point in time, the direction is that we're gonna be looking at raising the roads, whether or not we do the train. Because the city of Miami Beach is struggling with the situation of sea level rise. And you know, all indications are it's not gonna get any better. So we need to address that, whether or not the train moves forward. Is there a cost? Um, certainly, I mean, if you wanna talk about Washington Avenue in and of itself, as I mentioned before, most of Washington is at or above 3.7, so we wouldn't be looking at a significant cost of raising Washington. We'd probably be talking about something, you know, a million dollars or less to do some, you know, blending out of, of the few minor areas that are just a shade under 3.7. Um, if you're talking about Fifth Street, obviously Fifth Street is a much bigger street, but as I mentioned before, it's a state road and the state would be uh, expected to fund a lot of that raising of the road and, and they've admitted that they need to get on board with the city's program and thankfully they've done that on Indian Creek. <laughs> We're in conversations with them about Collins in the 50s. As you saw last week there was a lot of water on Collins Avenue southbound in the 50s. Um, Fifth Street is in the same boat. So How much does Fifth Street have to go up here? Washington's in good shape. How much? How about Fifth Street? Fifth Street at the all west end of Fifth Street, I think the elevations are somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.4. So we're looking at a approximately 2.3 uh, feet. And that's at Fifth and Alton. At Fifth and Alton. And Fifth and Washington is it? Fifth and Washington is about 3.7, and, and it gradually 
like most of the city, you know, we were a coastal ridge and we filled in to the west. So as we filled in, those areas are lower and lower as you transition towards the bay. So the highest elevation raising of the street needs to take place on the western side of the city where we're most vulnerable on the east side of the city. Um, in many cases, we're much better off. Hi, my question is, have we, is, are we serving the city the best by making our traffic study at the 5th Street Causeway? Why haven't we made a traffic study at 87th Terrace and Harding Avenue? And then minus what comes out on 5th Street. So we have a more accurate reading of how much is from Sunny Isle, Surfside, everything else. And are we, in fact, serving our community by not penalizing these people for using our roads? Why don't we get money from them to build this subway system that's going to go around and around? I mean, there is, I've, I've heard figures as high as 80% of the traffic that moves through Miami Beach in the morning and in the evening is not from Miami Beach. So if you're only counting at, at the Fifth Street Causeway, you're counting a gazillion cars, I don't know the exact figure, that move through Miami Beach every day, but are not in fact Miami residents. There was a study that was done in the I don't remember the exact date, mid to late 2000s. And that did not show any significant cut through traffic at that time. You we didn't have Sunny Isles at that we time. Have, and I'm just giving you one information that's available. We have, um, there has been discussions about the possibility of like um, intercept tolls or a cordon toll around Miami Beach, which could possibly look to see how much of the traffic again is, is cut through? How but we don't have any updated numbers since that time. Okay. But it would make more sense to make that type of traffic study, correct? The, the, the demand that's in South Beach is not generated by cut through traffic. You have sufficient um, generators of trips and you have out? sufficient attractors of trips that are going within the beach and also going off of the beach and coming onto the beach. Okay. So you're going to have that regardless. Folks, it's 8 o'clock. We're going to take a couple last questions, then we're going to wrap. Okay. Is it set in stone that it's going to be on Dade Boulevard, or is it going to be on 17th Street? And if it is on 17th Street, how much of that has to be raised? So it's it's not going to be on 17th Street at this point. We looked at 17th Street, but because of the congestion and the heavy traffic that currently exists on 17th Street and the configuration of that street, our consultants looked at Dave Boulevard. We also looked at the This is going to eliminate the traffic. We looked at the potential ridership that could be generated by serving those neighborhoods closer to Dave Boulevard as well as the Man Beach Senior High School, where we saw a slight bump in our traffic, in our ridership projections. You know, uh, we, we have never claimed, and I don't think the city claims, that this is going to eliminate the traffic problem. It is going to provide an alternative to people who are, are stuck in traffic, and that traffic issue is going to continue to grow with or without this project. So what, what the city is looking for here is an alternative to sitting in traffic congestion. And if you experience traffic congestion today, 10 years from now, you will likely experience more traffic congestion with or without this project. But with this project, you'll have an alternative. Assuming it connects. <laughs> I have a, a comment following up on that, rather than a question. Just, it's fiscally response. Is it fiscally responsible? as well as quality of life responsible to the residents. Those are the issues that I, I keep hearing from everybody, but that fiscal responsibility of not even clearly knowing what it's going to cost, what the ridership will cost, I'll, I would imagine you haven't considered most, most rail systems across the country 
are in states that actually have income tax, as well as ridership costs. And there's usually a need for police involvement for people who jump the turnstiles. Mm -hmm. So there's, it, it, there's <coughs> ancillary costs to a project like this that will, if it's not well thought through, well financed, well considered, then fiscally it falls on the people who live here. That's mm -hmm. Your point is very well taken, and that is what we're in the process of. And those questions are what we're in the process of getting defined answers to. That's why this is project development. It's the planning phase. No, it's not a done deal. We're in the process of getting ridership forecasts, cost estimates, and technical feasibility. The commission has not yet made a decision as to whether they're going forward follow this project. And we, we are looking at all the potential costs. As the so first meeting I've been to, to, that wasn't necessarily the impression. When, did you have a comment on some of the fit you yes. wanted to make? Yes, I just wanted to apologize. I, I want to acknowledge that we did receive um, written questions from South of Fifth Neighborhood Association, as well as Wagner. And because of the hurricane, we, we were in the middle of writing those, those um, answers and we are a little bit delayed so I want to apologize for that delay. We are in the process of getting our final document together and we'll be emailing those, distributing those by close of business tomorrow. They sent it in August, so, correct? August 31st. August. Eric, please. Um, and just, I want to just say because I'm hearing a lot of the same frustration coming from the crowd, from the panel. Um, and a lot of it circ uh, circ circulates around the process. Um, this process is a really lengthy and difficult one. Um, I liken it sometimes to baking a cake. We're really just taking the ingredients out of the refrigerator and putting them on the counter right now. If we taste the ingredients as it is today, it doesn't taste good. I I'll admit that 100%. How far away are we from putting the first show on? We're probably six months away from having a report finished. This is the input that we're supposed to be getting from the community to put the initial report together. How many and then, people think this is a good idea? Raise your hand. Got one. You don't even have three. Oh, three. Three. I think it's a good idea. Can I, I, tell us I, I couldn't agree with you more than we feel frustrated. Uh, about the process or the lack of information about the process. And Winston, when, when you do answer those questions, uh, say we don't know the answer to that yet. We don't have that information. I mean, it's fine. We, we just want to participate. We, we, we just want to be a part of the conversation and, uh, and, be, and be heard. You know, So if you don't know, say you don't know. That's okay. Why are we a member of the Streetcar Coalition? We are a member of the Streetcar Coalition. Coalition. We're a member of um, the ACTO, which is the Transit Association. We're a member of NACO, which is um, pedestrian and bicycles. We're a member of many organizations. We're a transportation department. We want to get as much information about all transportation alternatives all the time. Okay, so since when we could. Hang on now. We could keep going for a while, but I want to be respectful for everyone's time. So just a couple concluding thoughts. First, I hope you got a little better sense now of two important projects. The Beach Corridor project being driven by the county and the Miami Beach project. The Beach Corridor project, 41st and 2nd, making its way over the MacArthur, and the Miami Beach project, at least the phase we're talking about, 5th and Alton, oh, I'm sorry, 5th and Alton down 5th and up Washington. The Beach Corridor project, they're still thinking about the technology. They haven't really landed, we heard, light rail, maybe a little bus rapid transit, who knows, maybe BRT would be an interim solution. They're still working that. On the Miami Beach project, this project is pursuing the light rail alternative. It is fair to say that the Miami Beach project is further ahead, partially because the decision has been made by Miami Beach not to pursue federal funding. The logic is they want to sort of jumpstart the process, but the county 
is still considering federal funding. Federal funding will elongate that process, some suggest, you know, for several, for years. We don't know how many, but let's, let's say years. So those are the two projects, and importantly, these projects are meant to come together with the goal of moving around Miami Beach and going over. That is the intent. So look, let me leave it at that for, for that point. Um, I think it's important for all of us, individually and collectively, to get more informed and to get more engaged. I just think that that is a pretty obvious conclusion. So let me offer a few thoughts. First, go out to the Miami Beach website, the city's beach website, miamibeachfl.gov, go to the little Google search and type light rail. There is a fabulous page that has all the background documents you'll see from the county. There are FAQs. There's a lot of excellent information. So I think that's a very, very good first step. Second, you saw on the plan, and this planning process is now going to take us to the spring, that there are some meetings. Now, Winsome, a question, are any of those dates hardwired that we could just share, you know, be at this place at this date? I would say the 15th is the closest to being confirmed. We're still, well, that's our goal, and we're looking for a meeting location. So okay. hardwired, no. Okay, but November? Just no, November 15th, there's plan to be something. That's our goal. Okay, right. so there's something coming but, but on the 15th. We will update 15th. our website and we'll be sending email blasts. So if you, we will take the signing sheet and add it to our mailing list and send you email notices of any meetings. Okay. Monitor the commission hearings. This project has been being discussed by the commission since calendar year 2015. So this is in motion, there are discussions, so I think it's very important to monitor. Speak to your friends and neighbors, talk to your neighborhood or organization. If you're in SOFNA, South of it, Michael, how would they get connected to what your group's up to? A uh, co couple, of, couple of different ways. If you like Facebook, uh, just type in South of Neighborhood Association. Uh, there's, uh, you can like us there. There's also information there about how to join our, uh, you can click through and join our uh, newsletter list. And if you don't like any of that, just remember SOFNA at SOFNA.org. Uh, send us a quick note, say add me to your list and we'll, we'll put you on it. There's no requirement that you live in the neighborhood to be on our list, so feel free if you're interested to do that. We also have our meeting uh, next a week from tonight at 6 p.m., uh, Jimmy Morales, the city manager Jimmy Morales, and uh, I would imagine some of the same crew uh, will, will, will be there and uh, making a presentation and answering questions. That's great. And also, you know, uh, this group's done a great job at representing what's going on. A lot of this is policy driven. So if you have an opinion one way or the other, I think communicating with the mayor and the city commission. Go out to the Miami Beach website, miamibeachfl.gov, type in Mayor and Commission, and all their contact info will come up. I'm sure they would be very open to hear what your opinion is, pro, con, or sideways, and respond. Can we but please give them some applause? We're, we're about to. No. <laughs> and we can give our panelists a round of applause, please. And just finally, stay connected with Miami Beach United. You have a little sheet, miamibeachunited.org. We will be making this a top priority, so we would welcome your thoughts and input. If you got value tonight, I'd ask you to consider becoming a member. It's a nominal fee, and that way you can help influence uh, our efforts. I thank you all for a wonderful evening. I appreciate your, your patience, and we'll be in, uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you. The second most important, thank you sir, I love your question. The second most important topic is an initiative called the Residents' Right to Know. It's really a comprehensive effort to make sure residents are informed about stuff happening in the city and a seat at the table. More to come, thank you for that.